All right, perfect. So we'll transition. We're going to have a talk from Mike Hurdy from Children's National on teaching procedures, a best practices approach. He's going to take us through. So we have a little more baseline to work with. Hello, everyone. So over the next 20, 25 minutes, we'll be going over how we can harness some of uh, the educational research that's been done across multiple domains to improve our educational sessions. So while we all wish that our trainees, medical students, residents, even young attendings, uh, sprung into their, that part of their career fully formed out of the ocean like Venus here with all their skills fully intact, unfortunately that is not the reality and I think becoming a doctor is a lot more like this. And so it, we need to keep this in mind when we're training our trainees that this is a time of great anxiety and oftentimes, uh, I think as we all may be familiar with, your abilities as a physician can be closely associated with your uh, self-value. So keeping our trainees' psyche in mind, trying to create a safe space for them, as we'll talk about later in the talk, is very important. These are the learning objectives of the overall workshop. Uh, we'll be focusing on the first two, describing best practices and simulation, and then also how to put some uh, examples from educational theory in, uh, into practice for our individual educational goals. Now, because you can't really have enough learning objectives, uh, and we'll talk about the importance of good learning objectives uh, further on in the talk, uh, here are my particular learning objectives for this portion of the workshop. So we'll be describing what makes a procedure a good candidate for simulation. We'll describe the concepts of mastery-based learning and deliberate practice, and how we can use those concepts to improve our teaching. And then uh, the overall goal will be to um, help you all develop a curriculum for simulation-based training. So we're all familiar with this, this paradigm, see one, do one, teach one. This is Dr. William Halstead. He created the first surgical residency in America. And while a lot has changed in Dr. Halstead's day, uh, this is something we've all encountered in our clinical practice. And we've all are, we all are familiar with the potential pitfalls of this approach to medical teaching. I'd advocate for a new paradigm, see one, practice many, do one. We'll get there through this outline. So this outline it will form the backbone of our talk, and this is adapted from Taylor Sawyer's uh, article coming out of University of Washington. And these steps are outlined in the handout you have in front of you. So we'll go through this one by one, but we'll primarily focus on steps three and four, practicing the procedure on a simulator and proving competency to then advance to clinical practice. So what procedures make a good candidate for simulation? I would argue that any procedure can be graphed somewhere on this grid. So the prevalence of the procedure is how often you can expect to encounter that procedure in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. And the acuity of the procedure in this context is how quickly the procedure needs to be performed once its indication has arisen. So I'm a pediatrician, had to include a pediatric procedure. So uh, the, reducing a nursemaid's elbow. Relatively common issue in the pediatric ER, but low acuity. A child's going to guard their arm until you figure out how to do this procedure. Whether that's asking someone who's more familiar with the procedure, watching a YouTube video, reading about it online, you have time to figure out how to do this before you approach the patient. Suturing is also a very common procedure, but I'd argue it's higher acuity. Because while the laceration repair itself can wait, once you get started, you have to respond to changes in how the laceration comes together and how the patient's responding uh, in relatively short order. So familiarity and a high degree of comp higher degree of competency is required. Now the Epley maneuver for BPPV, it argues relatively low frequency as well as low acuity. On the other end of the spectrum, if you're delivering a baby in the emergency room, by definition, that's a high acuity situation because you don't have anyone to help you out. And at least for the pediatric ED, fortunately, a relatively rare uh, procedure. So I would argue that these um, high acuity, low occurrence, or low prevalence procedures are the best candidates for simulation because it offers you the opportunity to practice a procedure more often than you would in even weeks, months, years of clinical practice in a single educational session. And then also, when the time comes to encounter those procedures in that rare instance, you'll have that familiarity and you can have that muscle memory from the time you spent in the uh, simulation. 
So what I challenge you to do now is, to, on the handout in front of you, to list two to four procedures that you think might fit those criteria that you might want to bring back to your institution and create a procedure curriculum. about 30 more seconds. And as we go through the rest of the talk, I'd like you to keep these procedures in mind and as we discuss the uh, benefits of the approach we'll be talking about and the challenges, I'd like you to think how those procedures, uh, you may answer those questions for yourself. All right, so starting at step one, learning about the procedure. So this is a very cognitive step. This is where someone who might otherwise be unfamiliar with the procedure begins to learn more about it. So what is the procedure? How is it done? Why might it be done? What are the indications and contraindications? What are the adverse events you might want to look out for when you're performing the procedure in real life? Uh, this, there's as many ways to communicate this information as there are to communicate uh, any sort of information. It could be a lecture, e-learning module, handouts, uh, just a very informal discussion prior to beginning your simulation session. It really depends on your environment, your learners, and uh, the individual procedure you're talking about. Now, this step ends when the learners have demonstrated their learning, and that can be in something as formal as an actual, uh, like a test out, or it can be as informal as a discussion where the learners repeat back to you the things that you think are most essential for them to have learned. You then move on to step two, seeing the procedure performed. This is the part that you were not allowed to do earlier with the Legos. So this aids in the visualization of the procedure and again helps with that familiarity. So this is, the important part here is that the learners see the procedure performed by a competent pr uh, practitioner. And that can be either in person or in video on a real patient or on the simulator that you have, uh, use, use, eh, that you're using for your session. An important part of this is to break the procedure into individual steps, similar to how you did with building the Legos. Label those steps. And then, uh, what can be, you go that extra mile, can be very helpful to, to have you perform the procedure while the learners repeat the steps back to you as you do them. This step ends when the learners have seen the procedure and they can identify the component steps. As an example, no one teaches someone how to tie their shoes by going through the whole procedure from you know, first, first knot all the way to the finished product at once, right? No one would learn to tie their shoes if that was how we taught it. Uh, so we break it, we break it down into steps, and that's, this is the same idea, whether we're talking about tying our shoes, I mean, taking eight separate steps into tying your shoes, or something like intubation, a, a more complicated procedure. Step three, again, this will form the, the uh, mo most of our talk. This is where the learner develops practical skills and muscle memory through practice on the simulator. And this step is completed once adequate repetition has occurred so that the learner feels like they've gained enough skill that they want to prove their competence, they want to test out and, sh and show that they can perform the skill somewhat independently or at least on an actual patient. Now, uh, one step I sort of skipped over is in the in the see one, do one, teach one model, the do one was done on a patient, right? Your first time doing the procedures on a patient. So why would you simulate? And uh, for half the people in the room, this is, sort of, is self-evident, but I think it should be uh, considered. Uh, 
So simulation provides a safe space for our learners. It's a place where learners can make mistakes, push themselves beyond their comfort zone in a way that doesn't result in possible harm to a patient. That said, this is something that's it's on us as the educators, as the instructors, to create that safe space for our learners. So um, it's helpful to potentially even state that out front at the beginning of the session, recognizing that we're all here to develop our skills and improve our ability to take care of patients, and it's okay to make mistakes. Um, uh, sort of a paradigm that's helpful to model is the idea of an athletic coach. So coaches provide feedback to their athletes, not to critique them as people or as athletes, but to improve their future performance. And I think that's something that most people are familiar with, so if you use that example, that can help uh, sort of distance the learner from internalizing their feedback as sort of a personal attack. Another reason why we can simulate, or why simulation is helpful, particularly for those low occurrence procedures, is that it gives us a chance to practice, gain multiple repetitions on what might otherwise take years of clinical practice to gain familiarity with. I love this quote from Vince Lombardi. It's not practice that makes perfect, but perfect practice that makes perfect. For the next few slides, we'll talk a little more about what makes practice perfect. Now, another way of talking about perfect practice, uh, it's come across in the educational literature, is deliberate practice. So this was pioneered by Anders Ericsson, and uh, it is different than repetition or simple hours spent practicing. Now, the way I think about the difference is uh, driving a car. So, uh, many of us have thousands of hours behind the wheel of a car, but we're not ready to race NASCAR, right? So why did our skills stop developing? You know, have, don't we all have 10,000 hours behind the wheel? Shouldn't we all be experts? Um, it's because our time spent behind the wheel after a certain point stops becoming deliberate practice and becomes simple rote repetition. The important components that came out of Dr. Erickson's work looking at, uh, first, at highly talented violinists and then uh, this work was replicated in elite athletes, chess grandmasters, high-performing individuals across multiple disciplines, was that one is you need to have motivated learners. This makes sense, but hopefully by tying your simulation educational session into actual clinical practice, your learners will be motivated to learn more because they want to improve their clinical skills. You need to have clear learning objectives. I talked about learning objectives at the beginning of the talk. This is where this comes back. Without clear goals for the educational session, the learner and you as the instructor can't tell if you've succeeded or not. And so that is a very important part of setting, of establishing deliberate practice in your learners. You need adequate time for repetition. I think this is, might be one of the hardest ones actually for us as, as educators because often time is one of our most limited resources. But allowing adequate time for your learners to practice multiple times, have that incremental improvement, that's essential. And then uh, providing feedback. You know, you set a goal, and then if you met it, being told that you met the goal. And if you didn't meet it, what can be done differently in future attempts to allow closer, um, uh, getting closer to achieving that goal? This feedback, uh, after, after a certain level of competency, can be provided by the person themselves. But early on, it's important for us to provide external feedback. And this is an example of what deliberate practice does not look like person is clearly distracted uh, in the operating room. This is what deliberate practice looks like. So if you have a room full of learners, it's quiet, they've got their tongues out, focusing on their task, then you know you're doing something right, you're tapping into something powerful, and your learners are going to get a lot out of that session. So look for this. All right, so how can we encourage this state of deliberate practice in our learners? So, to get that, to get them sort of buying into it, uh, uh, fidelity is an important concept in simulation, but it really depends on what procedure you're, you're simulating and how you get that degree of fidelity. So for instance, one of the highest fidelity simulators I've ever had for uh, abscess IND was a chicken breast with vanilla pudding injected under the skin. Super gross, I know, I know. But uh, it was extremely helpful for, for learning how to do the procedure. Uh, so the session this morning, some of you guys were in there, and that's a perfect example of how you can be creative and uh, use a very high fidelity simulator in what might not be sort of typically considered that category. You need to establish clear learning objectives. This can be a little harder. What, how successful does your, does your participant need to be to have achieved success? 
We talked a little bit earlier uh, in debriefing the LEGO exercise about the variations in procedures once they've actually been performed. So the differences in airway anatomy, for example. How far do you want to get into that as, uh, in your teaching session? Depends on you, your learners, and what, do, what, uh, what level you're teaching at. Giving feedback is essential here as well. So uh, this, is how you, this is how your learners get closer to achieving their goals. There are several options for providing that feedback. So one option is to have your learner go through the entire procedure and then provide feedback at the end for the areas where performance could potentially be improved. Another option is to have them perform the procedure and once you've determined that a critical mistake has been made, stop them, explain why that mistake was so important or important enough to stop the procedure, allow them to rewind and then go through the whole procedure again, hopefully getting over that hurdle the next time. You can also provide real-time feedback without stopping the procedure as they go through it. Step four, this is proving competency. So this is where once, some, once someone has had adequate time to, uh, to practice the procedure on the simulator, they feel like they're ready and they have the skills necessary to advance to, to performing the procedure on a patient. Uh, so this is done by assessing their competency and it is completed when they've past your, your test or your level of, uh, to your satisfaction. Now this step is extremely difficult and I don't have any, any easy answers for you, unfortunately. So sometimes defining procedural success can be, can be easy, like the IV is in place or it's not, but for other procedures it can be more difficult. Like there are, we've all seen different degrees of successful laceration repair, for instance. Like how successful is successful? What is good enough to move on to a patient? Um, that's that's very difficult to decide sometimes. Uh, one way you can assess competency is to develop a checklist for the procedure, a list of yes, no uh, questions for were different aspects of the procedure performed. Now this is very easy to fill out. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of skill to grade this. Something was performed or it was not. It's also easy for the learner to get feedback on something was performed or it wasn't. Unfortunately, you lose some of the nuance in the procedure and um, you can have someone perform the perform to the checklist and maybe miss some of the overall uh, sort of transition between steps. Global rating scale is another option. So this is a general sense, maybe on a scale of zero to 10, how well was the procedure performed? Now this gives a better sense of where the trainee is sort of on a developmental continuum, but it's, you know, what's a six out of 10 intubation versus an eight out of 10 intubation? Kind of hard to distinguish, right? So there's another option where there's a, a hybrid approach where you can have uh, it checklist components for the critical aspects of the procedure and then a general rating scale for how well you th they were approaching independent competency. For several of these procedures, there are published validated checklists that you can see and see if it's, someone has already developed this, uh, saving you this step. Now mastery-based learning, I want to talk about for a few minutes, it's a way of getting at um, assessing competency that ensures that all of your learners at the end of the session have demonstrated competency. Now, the idea here is that you're, you create a series of individual modules that are escalating in difficulty, and your learners only advance to the more difficult scenarios once they've passed the earlier, easier scenarios. Uh, this results in having, if everyone completes all the scenarios, they've all demonstrated similar degrees of competency, but it may take different amounts of time or repetition to complete that, uh, to complete the, the modules. So for example, going back to the idea of, of example of laceration repair, now say you have a rock star resident who's just extremely good at laceration repair and you have four stations of escalating difficulty. Maybe that resident gets the first station first try, second, third, fourth, all in one attempt and so passes four stations in four attempts. They've demonstrated their competency. The next resident to come through maybe has more trouble with, uh, with laceration repair, and so they pass the first station, it's very straightforward, easily in one attempt. They take two tries on the second station, takes two more on the third station, takes three tries on the fourth station. At the end of the day, they've also learned how to pass that fourth station to the same degree of competency of that first resident, just took them a little longer. So this technique can take a little more time than just having everyone repeat, but it ensures that everyone has understood the material. As an example, uh, this is from a paper where they used, or were teaching internal medicine interns how to perform lumbar puncture, and they used a mastery-based learning approach. Let's see if I can get a 
Awesome. So this was uh, prior to the curriculum, and this is, based, this is grading them on checklist success, with 85% being uh, designated as the level of competency. So you can see prior to the curriculum, only one intern was competent in the procedure as they defined it. After the mastery-based learning approach, all of the interns had demonstrated competency on the subsequent test out. This, they were compared to uh, neurology residents, and you can see a similar distribution to the pre-test um, internal medicine interns. So it shows the power of how you can bring everyone up to that level of competency. That said, there is a component of teaching to the test here, uh, so this just further emphasizes the importance of having a really good test. All right, so who is this? Usain Bolt. Who's this? His coach. What's his coach's name? I didn't know either. It's Glenn Mills. Uh, so Glenn Mills actually stopped running in high school, but that Usain Bolt never achieved his level of international success until he started training under Glenn Mills. Now, I like this quote about, uh, about Usain Bolt, that he's still not as strong as he could be. You'd think this would be from earlier in his career, but it was actually after the Beijing Olympics when Usain Bolt set three world records. So uh, this, to me, just reminds me to set high expectations for my learners because you know, it's important to support them and encourage their development, but if we don't set high expectations, they won't meet them. So um, just something to, to keep in mind. Step five, uh, actually performing the procedure on patients. So the, the idea here is you get exposed to all those variations in patient anatomy and procedure scenario. That, uh, that came up in the debriefing from the LEGO exercise. Now it's up to you to decide if you want your learners to have gradual autonomy with this as they approach patients, or if this is a simple low risk procedure that then they're able to perform independently. Now this step really ends when you retire, but if you spend enough time not doing the procedure, you then can uh, create a system for your learners to continue to develop their skills or prevent skill loss uh, longitudinally. And so this uh, simulation is, again, an excellent uh, tool here. You can use the same simulator you used in step three. And because uh, you imagine if you're choosing a low occurrence procedure, this is something, simulation might be the only opportunity for someone to practice in between those rare occurrences. And this step continues on throughout the career. So in your handout, uh, I listed these questions here. They're in the yellow boxes. So um, we'll move on to the next stage in the workshop. But uh, later on today, on, on the way home, whatever, uh, you can think of those list of two to four procedures that you came up with at the beginning of the talk. And then when you want to develop your own teaching session, try and answer these questions. because so These are the, what I believe to be the primary challenges faced by each step in this approach. But I think if you can address these questions to your satisfaction, you'll develop an excellent uh, teaching session. The references are also in the handout, um, some excellent overview of some of the educational literature related to procedural training. And I welcome any questions. All right, so no questions. Good job. Excellent.